Hello, how's everyone doing? My name is Kate Stoltz and I'm just uh, seeding some tea. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about four common misconceptions about Amish people. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I grew up Amish. I spent, uh, I would say about half of my life in the Amish community and half of it out. Not, not quite, but it's, it's getting there. Um, I spent the first 18 years of my life very much in the Amish community and then slowly left. And since then I have been living in um, very different surroundings, uh, working in the fashion industry. Um, I've had the privilege of experiencing other cultures. Um, but along the way, I have spoken out about my experience uh, growing up in the Amish community um, many times. But when, there are several things that I've always wanted to address, but I didn't really have uh, I guess I, it's not that I didn't address them. I feel like they just haven't been clarified enough. And I wanted to go over them today and kind of explain the four common misconceptions that I often hear from people asking me about my life or about what it was like. Um, and even when I see people talking about the Amish community, whether it's in movies or television shows or newspaper articles, um, these are the four misconceptions that I constantly see. And uh, I'm just going to dive in. Um, the first one is the misconception that all Amish people are the same. I'm going to say straight off the bat that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, there are approximately half a million Amish people living in the United States right now. I don't know what the latest census is, but um, there's a lot of us. And we all come from different, I mean, not all from different churches, but with an average of approximately 100 people per church, that's a lot of different churches. And within those churches, there are a lot of different levels. Um, and even within that, like, first of all, we're all individuals. So we all have individual personalities, individual outlooks on life, individual ways of interpreting uh, the religious faith and our background, the way we relate to each other, the way that we talk, the, you know, different, um, you know, not everybody's a farmer. There are many different, uh, many different, um, you know, uh, careers. You know, some people are farmers, some are construction workers, others work in offices doing, you know, being secretaries, uh, other people are bakers. There, there are many different occupations within the Amish community. Um, and within that, we're all, you know, and in addition to that, we're all individuals that when we relate to each other, um, you know, we kind of create our own circumstances. And then as children, we react to the circumstances that we're born into. And that all, that creates us as individuals. And so I guess the reason why I want to kind of start with this is because um, I think the Amish people deal with that misconception more than most other uh Kind of communities do because from the outside looking in they do look alike you know the majority of people dress the same and um not many people are outspoken about their experiences so you hear a very limited number of stories and the majority of stories that you hear are from people that leave you don't really hear from uh for example my two sisters that are still living in the Amish community and, you know, have their families and are integrated into the Amish way of life. You, you never hear from them. So you don't hear their side of the story. You only hear, it's typically Amish teenagers that leave and are in their very rebellious states of their life and ready to burn it down to the ground, which is not a, which is not a fair portrayal of the Amish people. Um, and I include myself in that category. You know, when I first started speaking up about my experience, I was 21 years old. I was in probably the, one of the most rebellious states of my life and just kind of ready to uh, expand my world. And um, I didn't have a lot of experience outside of the community, which, you know, limited my perception to what I knew and what I had personally experienced. Um, so, you know, just kind of tackling the idea and the misconception that everybody's the same you know, if you look at it from the outside looking in, um, you know, the majority of the men, they're wearing their straw hats, they have their suspenders and the black pants or some wear blue pants, whatever. But it's relatively similar in the way that they dress. You know, for church, they usually wear the vests and then the, the, they're called the vomises. Uh, I guess it's like a, a blazer, 
but it, it you know, it's like a homemade blazer. Um, and they typically use the same clothing patterns, which end up with the majority of people looking the same. But when you actually get into um, the churches and you actually start interacting with the people and you start um, understanding the different levels of rules and ordinance and the fact that every single church is dealing with an individual group of people, individual leaders, individual um, people within the church, you start realizing that the idea that they're all the same is, it's not necessary, it, it it's, could be further from the truth. Um, and then in addition to that, there's, there are common stereotypes when you think about the Amish people. For example, when you think of Amish people, you think that they all drive buggies. Um, that's not true. I actually have, I was friends with, I was best friends with this girl who was from a more liberal uh, Amish church and she drove a car. Her mom and dad had a car. They were Amish, um, but it was from a more advanced Amish community. And they drove cars, they had radios, they had a piano in their house, they had television, they had cell phones. Um, she wore makeup all the time in front of her mom. Uh, they were, you know, there were certain technologies that they participated in and they were Amish people. And at the same time, I have an extensive family that is, you know, comes from different areas of the United States, has, you know, comes from different churches. And even within them, there are a lot of people from different levels of the church. And, and I would say the way that I grew up was kind of like in the middle, but then there are churches that are much more strict than what I experienced, which was, you know, and I, you know, just thinking about, um, there was a time when we went to visit my great uncle in Maryland and we didn't interact with them often, but when we went to visit, my great uncle's children, who would have been my mom's age, they didn't allow their children to play with us because they saw us as bad examples for them because their church was so much more strict and they had different rules than our church did. So they, we didn't necessarily play with those kids because they saw us as bad examples. Um, so the idea of, you know, parents wanting, you know, to, kind of limit their children to playing with people that they felt would be a good example to them. That also happens within the Amish community. It happens outside of the Amish community. I think the majority of parents will want their children to play with people that they feel like are going to be a good example for them and going to kind of uh, lead them in a positive direction. And, you know, with that, me and my cousins and my sisters, we, we laughed about it because we found it so fascinating that they found us to be too progressive to play with because we had always thought of ourselves as, you know, not necessarily the most progressive church. So there were children that our parents didn't want us to necessarily interact with because they were more uh, progressive. So with that, uh, there's many different levels, many different rules and many different experiences. Um, so, you know, just kind of going back to that idea of this perception that all Amish people are the same. The reason I'm bringing it up first is because, um, I have experienced occasions when I shared parts of my story and people took it as explanatory of all Amish people and as something that all Amish people would experience. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, you know, my experiences, my stories, the way that I experienced the Amish life was very much my experience. And even my sisters had a very different experience because they approached the rules differently. I was more rebellious from when I was a young kid. I was the middle child in a large family. So um, I kind of pushed back at everything. I was one of those kids. I pushed back on all the rules. I um, even things that weren't necessarily related to my religious upbringing. Um, if it was something that I felt like would uh, help me express my creativity or something like that, I would push back against it. That's just the kind of kid I was. Whereas my um, I'm going to 
use my older sister for an example because she was she was a lot less um, hesitant to participate in the rules and stuff than I was. Um, she didn't really have a problem with the church. She had, you know, so therefore she had a more positive experience with the people um, that were already part of the church because she wasn't rebelling against that. She wasn't pushing back against that. She wasn't obviously trying to uh, push back against that. So, um, you know, all of our experiences within the church are very different based on what we want for our lives and, and what we think of and the way that we portray ourselves. So when you think of um, kind of understanding the Amish people, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at it from my perspective and then also sharing my sister's perspective of being the same family, but not experiencing the same thing. Multiply that by 500,000 people and you have a very diverse population of people that experience it very differently. So, um, and the reason why that's so important to clarify is because if you see a story about Amish people, you have to remember that the story only accurately portrays what those people went through, those events, that specific person that they're talking about. And it's unfair to be like, okay, like now I know what the Amish people are like in that regard, you know, in terms of politics, in terms of the way they treat, you know, their wives or the way they raise their children or their viewpoints on the way that they read books. Those are issues that within each household are approached very differently. And, um, you know, when I just, my perspective, like anything that I say is coming from my perspective. And I guarantee that there's an Amish person that would disagree with me and would say, well, that's not what I experienced. So that's a very important thing to remember when you're reading stories about the Amish people, especially when you're watching movies about Amish people that kind of, uh, where they take a bunch of Amish people with the same experiences and portray it as this is what the Amish experience is like. Um, those, Whenever it's portrayed as, whenever they take a couple of people's experiences and portray it as that's what the Amish experience is like, I plead with you to recognize that that's not a fair portrayal of what the Amish life is actually like, but instead it's what those people's lives were like and, and those people alone. And, you know, the story should be told, you know, we should, we should all be free to talk about experiences and push for positive change and et cetera. But with that, we also need to remember that our experiences are ours alone. Um, all right, I wrote the points down. All right, the second misconception that I get is the way Amish people interact with outsiders. Um, there's this common misconception that, you know, the way that the questions are always asked, it's often almost like the person asking the question is expecting the Amish people to be contained within like a, a commune or something and they're all living on the same farm and they don't interact with outsiders. Um, I mean, I don't know that it, it's possible that that exists within the United States with some Amish people, but I'm personally not aware of that happening. Um, you know, from what I know, the major, you know, Amish people, they buy homes, land, farms from, you know, other Amish people or non-Amish people through realtors directly. It, it all depends on how they can find the real estate that is going to serve them. So, uh, you know, they're all living on individual uh, real estate individually owned real estate, unless they come together and they live with their parents or, you know, they, you know, have like a double, you know, some, some houses have like two houses right next to each other and they, they live together on the land or whatever. But those are typically family situations, not church situations. Um, and then this idea that people, Amish people don't interact with outsiders is also very misleading. Um, you know, growing up, I would, we would go to Walmart to buy things that we couldn't find at the local 
uh, there was like a local small vegetable and fruit market. They had like cheeses and stuff like that too, but it was close to our farm, so we usually went there. Um, but then there was a lot of stuff that we couldn't find there, such as sleeping bags and uh, gloves and hats for during the winter. Uh, so there were things like that where we went to Walmart, we went to Target, we went to the mall, we went to places to shop. Um, and, you know, occasionally we would go out to eat. We didn't, uh, you know, and I commonly find myself going back into telling my story. That's not my intention. My intention today is to kind of break down the misconceptions and to remind people that uh, our experiences are very different from each other. So I want to kind of refrain from telling my experiences, um, you know, but the level of interaction with outsiders really depends on, um, it depends on the individuals. It depends on, I mean, I know that some churches are a lot more strict with this. Uh, there are certain church districts that are incredibly strict with the way that they, in, the individuals interact with each other, the way they follow the rules. The rules are a lot more strict. And, um, I think the expectations of the individuals of themselves are a little bit different than uh, what other people would go through. But, you know, there, there are certain, certainly a lot of levels of, you know, interactions with outsiders. And it's not just the religious aspect that leads to whether or not people interact with outsiders. It's also, is a person, you know, are you an introvert? Are you an out, you know, extrovert? Do you enjoy going out and meeting other people? Are you one of those people that, you know, wants to get to know a lot of people, has people over all the time, uh, hangs out with a bunch of people? Um, that's going to affect whether or not you have a lot of non Amish friends or not. Like, um, and it also, your occupation, the occupation of the father and the mother and the children, um, that also affects how much interaction there is with outsiders. Um, for example, my grandfather was, he trained racehorses. He would um, travel up to Maine and other parts of Pennsylvania every week, and he would help these horse owners train their horses. He would work with other trainers within the race horse industry, and he, that's what he did for a living. He would go, and he, would, he made a lot of friends, and he would uh, watch the horses drive. He would, he would drive the horses themselves. He would bring, you know, wild horses in, calm them down, train them to be uh, very well-behaved racetrack horses. That was his job. And through that job, he met a lot of outsiders. He had a lot of interaction with non-Amish people. And, you know, compare that experience with my father, who was a farmer up until um, yeah, when he stopped farming. Uh, hmm. I think I was 18 or something. So, but he was a farmer for the majority of the time that I lived at home. So he didn't have as much interaction with outsiders as my grandfather did because his days were spent, uh, you know, plowing the fields and getting the crops ready, taking care of, you know, the animals on the farm and, and raising crops, raising vegetables. And, you know, that's how he spent his days. So his interaction was much more limited than my grandfather's, whose occupation was as a racetrack. Uh, as a horse trainer. So, you know, the interaction level with outsiders greatly depends on what the occupation is, if they're extrovert or introvert. And it also does depend on, you know, there are certain, I, I think it's fair to say that there are certain churches that would definitely encourage you to refrain from interacting with outsiders more than you have to. I think that's a general concept. Um, but you know, when it comes to actually being able to provide food for their family, if, if that job requires you to interact with other people, then, then it is what it is. Um, at the end of the day, Amish people, they have to provide food for the families and that, that's their primary focus typically. Um, so another misconception that I get that I find really frustrating is that all Amish people are submissive, timid, quiet, all of that. And I think it's a, it's kind of a tricky misconception because um, I think religiously speaking, I think women are encouraged to be, uh, you know, godly and um, 
well presented and they are encouraged to be good people. They're encouraged to love their husbands. You know, there, there are a lot of kind of expectations um, for women and also for men um, that would lead to those misconceptions. So it's not like these misconceptions are surprising. I, what I'm trying to do here is to just uh, kind of break that idea of it is what it is and, and that's it. Like that's not true at all. And with this one, um, I think this is another area where the level of uh, religious kind of devotion does play a part in it. There are certain churches that are more strict in the way that, you know, everybody behaves, the way that they compose themselves. Um, and, but this isn't limited to women. Usually, you know, what I've seen is when the women are expected to be more reserved, the men are also expected to be more reserved. So it's kind of like a more reserved culture uh, overall. And this applies to the children and so forth. Um, but I want to be very careful with the way that I say that because, you know, even within that, it doesn't mean that the wife is going to be this quiet little field mouse. Um, you know, our personal personalities and the way we present ourselves, the way that we interact with our friends does not depend on the religion that we practice. It doesn't determine, you know, that's us, who we are as people. And you can create all kinds of rules and whatever. It's not going to change the individual personalities of each person unless they decide that that's what they want for their life. Because, um, and I, I think the reason why this misconception is so kind of difficult to tackle is because, um, and important to tackle as well, is because I, I, I hear a lot of people kind of, um, interpreting the idea of the Amish woman as a very specific kind of stereotype. And that stereotype doesn't match up with what I experienced within my own, within my own background, within my own upbringing, my grandmothers, my aunts, my sisters, myself, um, and now my nieces and nephews. And when I hear that being said, I'm like, you really don't know the Amish people if you're saying that. You might, you know, and another thing I want to say is if you see Amish people out in the world, uh, I'm just going to say they're very conscious of the fact that outsiders are watching them and watching everything they do, watching the way they interact with each other, watching the way that they treat their children and everything. And I experienced that as a child, um, you know, as somebody that went to, as somebody that when I went out, into, for example, Walmart, um, and I overheard people talking about me almost as if they thought that I didn't understand English, and they would talk about my parents and about me, and they would make rather degrading statements about my culture, and it was like, that's not what it's like at all. Like, And it was very frustrating because it was like you – you know, you know that those stereotypes exist as an Amish person. And it's it's not like Amish people are champing at the bit to kind of be like, no, that's not what it's like at all. Um, they're, for the most part, uh, don't want to generalize too much, but um, overall, most of the Amish people have focused on the issues with it inside their community, inside their family. Um, and, you know, there, there, there is a limited interaction between the Amish people and people they don't know. So they don't really necessarily push back on those stereotypes very much. Um, it's winter, so I'm drinking tea because my it's winter. The weather is changing, so I'm drinking tea. Um, but in terms of all Amish women being submissive, uh, the reason why I wanted to address that is because I personally find it rather degrading and dismissive of women because it completely erases the personal characteristics and uh, individuals that live within these communities because they're not all just quiet little field mouse mice. 
There are very independent business women. There are successful business women. There are, you know, homemakers that de- that want to devote their lives to raising their children, or, or might, um, you know, some, you know, several of my cousins were unable to have children, even though they really wanted children. So they ended up becoming independent business women. And, you know, to characterize them all as submissive, uh, timid housewives that have no say in the matter completely erases the individuality that I personally saw within my own community and within my own family. So that's why I wanted to bring that up. And I, I want to bring up a couple examples of women in my life that really um, kind of explain what I'm trying to say. For example, my grandmother, um, she was, uh, my grandfather fell to his death when my mom was six, so I never met him. And my grandmother was then left to raise five children by herself. And that's what she did. She started a bakery. She financially supported her family. She raised the children by herself. She never got remarried until she was 80. Um, and you know, up until then, she was an independent homemaker. She took care of the family. She was this independent force of nature. And she did that with integrity. And, you know, I have so much respect for her. And then on the other side, you know, my, uh, my paternal grandmother, she was completely different. She was a very outspoken redhead. And I'm talking about genuine redhead. I, um, my brother actually has a son with red hair, like red hair. Gets that from my grandmother. And she was very outspoken. She wasn't afraid to tell anybody what she thought. Um, she was very religious in terms of she participated in the religion. She was um, a person that, you know, was very interactive with the community and all of that. But it didn't change her personality. It didn't change who she was. And it didn't stop her from um, being vocal about the things that she cared about. And that's... Um, in terms of the powerhouse in the family, I think she was definitely a lot more outspoken and a lot more in control than my grandfather was. So to kind of, uh, and, and those are just two examples. On the other side, on the flip side, I do know Amish women that I grew up with that were in the same church that would have fit the stereotype of the quiet, timid Amish wife. So it exists. And there are a lot of women that fall into that category, but there are also a lot of women that fall outside of that category that have very vibrant personalities. I mean, hello, I grew up Amish. I definitely don't fall into the category of submissive, timid person. Like I am my own individual. I've always been, you know, kind of strong in the way that I presented myself. Um, And, you know, those are just a couple of examples. But to just clarify, you know, that misconception of Amish women being submissive, it happens for sure. But then you also have to remember it also happens outside of the community as well. And it kind of comes back to who are we as individuals? Are we introverts? Are we extroverts? Do we want to be outspoken or are we a little bit more interested in, you know, are we, (laughs) are we a little bit more interested in cooking or growing vegetables or um, pursuing our career? Are we an introvert and don't want to interact with the outside world? Those are independent decisions that we make. And along with that, I don't want to, I don't want to erase the women that fall into that category of being submissive to husbands that are, you know, not great people, because let's be honest, that exists within the Amish community as well. That is that is an issue that is, um, ugh, I, there are a lot of movies and television shows that kind of present that issue as, um, they kind of present that issue as an Amish issue um, when they're telling these stories. And with that, I think it's really important to recognize that those situations happen and they should not be erased. We should you know, raise those voices and allow those voices to be heard. But when we're doing that, just remember to take it as an individual story. 
because if you take it as a story representing the entire culture, it really diminishes what those women have gone through. And it also unfairly releases uh, people that have negative behaviors from that personal responsibility of being held accountable and blames it on the religious part of the upbringing instead of blaming it on the individual. And that the individual is the one that should be held accountable, not the entire religious culture. And, and this is something that, um, you know, we kind of talk about a lot in, with other communities, but unfortunately the Amish people uh, have not been included with that conversation yet. So <laughs> that's why I'm here. Um, the fourth common misconception, um, I don't know if it's as common as I thought, and I just want to bring it up since it has been brought up to me so many times, which is, do Amish people believe in dental and health care? Do they believe in vaccines? Um, this is another one where it depends on the individual family. It depends on financial situation. Do the people have money to pay for the dentist? Um, these are not conversations that are limited to religion. And the reason I say that is because um, I'll tell you my personal experience, and then I'll also kind of expand on what I have noticed, you know, with outsiders. Um, one, my, uh, let's start with dental care. So my parents were always very, you know, they educated their children about how to take care of our teeth. I learned how to brush my teeth. I don't even remember when I started. Um, I have all of my natural teeth. I mean, I knock on wood. Never had a cavity in my life yet. <laughs> so I have all of my natural teeth because my parents took the time to educate me about dental care. And, you know, I brush my teeth every day. I was very strict about that. We went to the dentist. Um, I never had braces, but four of my brothers had braces. Um, my teeth were, they were nice enough to not need braces is basically where it was, where I can smile and it's okay. But you know, my teeth are perfect. I've often thought about Invisalign. The reason I haven't done it is because I'm rather stringent with my money and, uh, but it's not religious, you know? Um, and you know, all of my four brothers had braces, uh, for some reason, I mean, it goes into financial aspects, but, uh, basically they had jobs and they kind of, paid off their own dental care. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess us girls had straighter teeth and we were just, I don't know, we just weren't that interested in it. Um, and then by the time my younger brothers came along, it was, you know, cause it's my oldest brother who had braces because he had very bad teeth, like the, he had crooked teeth. So he had braces early on, he paid for it through construction. And then my, me and my two sisters, our teeth were like on the level where we didn't need braces. We could have had it and we would have benefited from it, but it wasn't like very important. And then my, by the time my three younger brothers were born, um, the financial situation in my family was a little bit better. So my parents were able to um, financially invest in their appearances a little bit more. Um, but that's just my family. That's my individual situation. Uh, whereas, you know, I personally know another Amish girl who had her teeth pulled out when she was young because I, you know, she wasn't educated about dental care and her family was rather poor and they didn't have money to go to the dentist. So this was a unique financial situation. Actually, I just thought of the fifth common misconception that I want to go over today um, because it's a, it's an important one and it's rather interesting. Um, but she, you know, she didn't get the dental care because her family was very poor. They basically, they barely had money to pay for food on the table. How are they going to afford going to the dentist? Um, and that's something that nobody should be shamed for. Um, you know, financial situations, we're all at different levels of financial situations and we just do what we got to do, right? Um, there shouldn't be shame in whether or not we're able to access certain things. Um, at the same time, let's not blame that on religion when it's a financial issue, which is, um, so I would say, you know, whether or not people get dental care, there are many aspects of it. You know, are people interested? You know, there, there are people, non-Amish, Amish from 
everywhere in society that just simply don't take care of their bodies as much as other people do. And that includes teeth. Um, so, uh, and then there are some people that just simply can't afford it. So, you know, it, it, there are more, um, there are more factors than just religion when it comes to whether or not people, you know, Amish people get dental care, but it's, if they don't, it's typically not a religious aspect. Now I'm just going to say there might be some churches that don't allow it. I'm not aware of it, but I'm also not, you know, I'm not a representative for those communities. I didn't experience that. There are some communities that are so much more strict than what I went through. So I didn't live that experience. I'm not, I can't speak on their behalf. So there, it's possible that that, that, that exists, but from what I have seen and heard and experienced, that's typically not the reason. Um, and the fifth and final misconception is, I didn't really think about the title, but um, it kind of goes back to finances. A lot of, um, I think something that people tend to forget if they're not in that situation where they've never experienced it is that there is poverty in the United States and there are people that really struggle to pay the bills. I come, you know, I come from a family and, you know, my dad was a farmer finance. You know, I still remember running to the bank with a check because there were 15, you know, there was $15 in the bank and you needed to clear the check before something, you know, before a payment went through. So I don't come from a very financially lucrative family. And even after I left, I worked, you know, 80 hour minimum wage jobs, you know, minimum wage jobs, 80 hours a week. So I know the struggle. I like, I come from that. And um, so I, I think we need to, when we're talking about these situations to understand that uh, each household has different struggles in terms of finances. Some, you know, there are Amish millionaires. There are also Amish people that are incredibly poor and struggle to keep a roof over their head. And I knew both when I was growing up, even within the same church, um, you know, the, the finances of the church, uh, again, I want to say, I can't speak for all churches, but from what I'm aware of, it's typically not a universal like financial situation. Each family has their own bank account. And uh, there are issues that come with come up within the Amish community that when you read a story about Amish people, I encourage you to think about the fact that kind of compare it to non-Amish stories and ask yourself, is this a financial situation because I've often seen a lot of stories being portrayed as an Amish situation when when you actually know the family and you actually know what happened it's a financial issue so and that's something that you know we deal with here in the United States and it's something that we have to think about when we talk about issues that arise within uh, social circles within communities and all of that and with that, I hope that we can be a little bit more empathetic to other people. So um, I see a bunch of comments. I'm going to go through the comments and then I'm going to end it. I see wire hyperspace. Hi, Kate. Got to keep warm. So a lot of hot drinks, hot, hot food, and maybe a shot of brandy now and then to stay healthy. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, winter is coming. So <laughs> warm food, hot drinks definitely feel better. Um, I'm a Dutch mix redhead too. Yes, my Dutch mom was one of seven kids. You know, if you're part of a, of a large family, I think you understand the dynamics of a large family in ways that people from smaller families do not because the dynamics are different. And that also changes the conversation around families and, and our experiences with our parents um, in a way that is not confined by religious beliefs. So... Um, I'm going to end it here. I hope this was informative and interesting. Um, my main goal of getting, uh, of doing this is to just clarify that uh, Amish people, you know, it's, Amish people is a very large umbrella term to describe a very diverse, dynamic uh, population of people that have differing opinions and different viewpoints on life. And 
therefore, I encourage you to think of them as individuals. And much like, uh, just compare it to, you know, it's easy to lump them all together because, again, they kind of look the same, but it's not representative of what actually happens. Uh, so I hope this was interesting to you guys. Uh, subscribe to the channel. I'm going to, as I think of things, I'm going to do more videos because, um, again, I feel like some of the things that I might have said might have been used to create stereotypes, and that is not at all what I ever wanted to uh, to do. You know, this is coming from my perspective. I'm not uh, I'm not a representative of the Amish people. I'm just trying to kind of uh, advocate for the idea that Amish people, you know, they're just like the rest of us. Some good, some bad. But are we ever, is it ever like really just good and bad? Or are we all a mixture of it all? And we all have, uh, you know, our issues and, you know, just gotta do what we gotta do. All right, I'll see you later. Have a good day. Bye.